This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 371 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, Kentucky Performance Products, EcoVet, and Hindsight Vision. Tonight, we have Jenny Carroll on to talk about the National Pony Cup. Donna Richardson is back to talk us through the pre St. George, and we are going to cover a great listener question. This is Reese Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, Reese. Welcome <laughs> and to Glenn's the here, too. Hey, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have, before we get started, let's set the theme for what we're going to talk about first. Yes. Got to get in the mood. Are you well, ready? That's the Olympic music. I'm yes. so ready. I am so ready. So we named the U.S. team this week, which is very exciting. I think everyone, I don't think it was really a surprise for anyone. I mean, all these horse and rider combinations have been doing great. Uh, but we have Allison Brock on the Kundrens uh, Roosevelt. We have Laura Graves on her own Verdades, Casey Perry Glass on Diane Perry's Dublé, and Stefan Peters from Four Wind Farms, Legless 92. Um, and then the direct reserve is Ro- uh, Rosamunda, who's Stefan's uh, second horse. And then uh, the traveling reserve is Shelly Francis and Patricia Stemple's doctor. So uh, really excited about this team. This is going to be a fun team. And uh, yeah, we're We've looking a couple forward. of new, newbies, you mm-hmm. know, sort of thing. Yeah. Right? Allison yeah. and Casey, fairly, uh, fairly new to the sort of international scene and, and the Grand Prix and all of that. So yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Allison, awesome. Yeah, Allison was the traveling reserve uh, for the Pan Ams. So, which is great. And, uh, you know, obviously, which is funny because we've been watching Laura Graves from being the real rookie to uh, now she's pretty experienced. So it's fun to see that. And of course, Stefan is fantastic and always uh, does a fantastic job at any huge international competition. So, and it's uh, fun to see a second horse, Rosamunda, also traveling, which is pretty cool. So... Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Was, well, Glenn, for I was Glenn, we, we've got to do the um, the British team. Yeah, I was looking at the horse breeds on the American team, and we've got pretty much all of Europe <laughs> yeah. covered. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hanoverian, Danish, Westphalian, Oldenburg, and a Rhinelander. So, yeah, pretty much. That's, that's the entire <laughs> Well, you Europe. definitely got Germany covered. <laughs> yeah, we got Germany covered. Germany, Denmark in there. Denmark, <laughs> Holland. Yeah, that's funny. exactly. <laughs> that's yeah, it's funny. There's not an American bred horse on there, but that's okay. We're working on it. Right? Yeah. Are we all breeders? <laughs> We're working on it. And then uh they also named uh the US six year old division for the Longines World Breeding Championships is Endel Ott. And uh we love Endel on uh his his dad owns Lucky Strike and we love, you know, Endel's great and we wish him luck. And also David Reitman uh on Kathleen Rains. Um, silver fair, silver file, yeah, silver file. So there's some um, extra letters in there, I think. But yeah, I think there is. But I think yeah. <laughs> so that will be really fun to see them head over there and see how they do. And uh, of course, Endel's a favorite of us on the, here on the show, and we wish he, him luck. He and gave us a great interview. If you want to so, go back and listen to that, he's a, a really funny guy. So yeah, we'll uh, snag him again for sure. And after the after the when championships, he gets back from Europe, mm-hmm. yeah. Definitely. I think this year will be the first time the World Young Horse Breeding Championships will not be held in Germany, right? It's being held in I think Holland. That's right. It's being held in Holland. Yeah, in Ermelo. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a cool thing—a change of venue for the young horses. Yeah. And, yeah, it's kind of fun. I think I think it won't matter for the the Americans as much, but I know the Europeans are all a all a brew about it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, and like I said, we've we've got a um, the uh, the England name it's uh, named its dressage. Team Can we just give Charlotte stuff? the gold and save her the trip? <laughs> uh, that's fine with me. She's Everybody got to defend that gold. <laughs> oh, she'll do great. I think that, that she's showing Vallegro this weekend for the first time. In Harper, I, mean, not, I think, yeah. Yep. Not that I stalk her at all on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> and yeah, half the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I saw her jogging uh, today uh, or yesterday. Uh, so, yeah, 
We're looking forward to seeing what he looks like. He hasn't been out in a while, uh, you know, and it's good for her to knock the dust off a little bit and see what it, what's going on. So, and it pretty much is the Carl Hester team. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> he, he's going to be there with Nip Tuck, and then he's got one of his students, Fiona Bigwood's going to be there, and then uh, we have Spencer Wilton's going to be there. So it's pretty much the Carl Hester team. Yeah, yeah. he's really going to. Can you imagine? I can't imagine coaching and riding, and oh my, he, I, I like have that's so much a lot of pressure, huh? Oh my god! Especially gosh. one of your one of your students is defending, <laughs> so the gold, oh, right? Defending, yeah. and I mean the whole thing. I think, is I think, yeah, it's at, at a certain point. It just, uh, I think Another they're just going to have office. fun as well, right? Like that yeah. would be awesome, awesome, you know. Um, that would be awesome. Because we know they're going to do well. As we've talked yeah. about on the, you know, the, uh, going to Rio, and we've talked about this with a couple of people now, uh, just adds, it's just adding an extra layer of trepidation to the whole thing, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, everything will be fine, but it's not like going to London. Uh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. or Tokyo. Right. You know, it's it's cute. My dad actually just went to Tokyo in business and came back and he goes, oh, I already saw that they're building the Olympic Stadium. <laughs> It'll be done three so, years yeah. ahead of time. Exactly. They'll have like, practiced a thousand degree. times by yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a real, it's really interesting to hear like how the Japanese are doing it and how, yeah. Ugh. They do yeah. everything that way. I mean, mm-hmm. it'll be guaranteed they'll be ready. <laughs> yeah, they'll be ready. So uh, I hope, I you know, of course we, we are, we'll, we'll keep in touch with everybody traveling and, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. So I hope it, it's really, I, I agree. I think it's going to be fine, but. Eh. Yeah, it's just every, and I think that the, the amount of spectators is going to be down. People are going to say, I'll stay home and watch yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Let That's NBC insane. cover it for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I am waiting for two weeks of no sleep. I am so excited. I mean, I like. Well, fortunately, I, it's in sort of in our time zone. It's only a little <laughs> off. So. That's, is it in the mountain time zone? What's I think it's mountain time. It's like an hour of off of Eastern, so it must and, be Central. Yeah, well, uh, I can't can't wait. <laughs> I mean, I, I stay up in the middle of the night. Like I'm so I watch it all the time. I, I really don't sleep. <laughs> I'm like all day, all night. fever. Yeah, I don't I'm have like, to oh. get up at three in the morning to watch cross country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I totally did. I know we all did. Like, oh, it's gonna be on. Dressage is on. How about Canadian team? Have they named it yet, or is it coming soon? We are waiting to hear what our team is going to be. Okay. I think it pretty much uh, Belinda Trussell has her spot secured. And so we're just waiting on who our second individual will Have be. Have they called you, Philip? They didn't, they didn't ask me for my opinion or anything. <laughs> they didn't ask you to ride either. Yeah. Oh, well, de- yeah, definitely not. They don't look <laughs> not this moment, year. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I just thought just being, you know, a media guy, they would just ask yeah. me how I felt about Your it. Your opinion, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, guys, we have, this is actually it's happening in, at the horse park. Yeah, really big show here. Uh, it is the National Pony Cup, uh, and it actually starts tomorrow. And Jenny Carroll, she has, she's a wonderful guest, and she talked with Glenn uh, last week. And uh, she's going to talk about the National Pony Cup, and I will let everybody know. I can tell you they have the most adorable ribbons and prizes. Like, I want a pony just so I can win these <laughs> ribbons. They're so cute. But Jenny does a great job, and she really has has brought along this Pony Cup, uh, and uh, I think you'll enjoy her interview. Yeah, and this was from the Horses in the Morning show with Jamie Jennings and I. Well, our first guest on the show today is Jenny Carroll. She's with the National Dressage Pony. Well, she is the founder of the National Dressage dressage pony cup and i'm a pony lover i have a hackney pony who doesn't do dressage because he he would just uh he'd be out of the ring and over the fence and it would be a problem but you have a lot of cute ponies that show up to do dressage at the kentucky horse park in july well good morning jenny good morning how cute is it to have all of those ponies in one place doing dressage it it, is a cuteness overload i must say I mean, it has to be the cutest uh, dressage show in the world. It is, possibly that. <laughs> um, one of our, our slogans on the back of the T-shirts that we have at the show say, yeah, I know my pony's cute. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we do have quite a few ponies. Of, you know, cuteness aside, they definitely are out there competing and um, doing every bit the uh, you know, as, as hard a work as the horses do, and they deserve the credit for that. And uh, many of them compete very well against horses and can, you know, beat them handily. And I do enjoy watching that, I must say. Is this um, an FEI uh, uh, show, by the way? 
Um, it has FEI level tests okay. within it. Got it. Um, ponies can't compete actually in CDIs. Um, that is, uh, they can compete in national shows doing FEI level work. So they can do the FEI pony test, pre St. George, I1, I2, Grand Prix. And uh, the Pony Cup has uh, $10,000 in prize money oh, wow. that we um, give from introductory level through Grand Prix uh, for adult amateur open and junior young riders. But the FEI riders that come and compete at the Pony Cup have added bonus prize money where if they receive a score above a 65, they get a $500 bonus. And if they receive a score over a 70, there's a $1,000 bonus for oh, that. Oh, wow. Well, that helps pay the bills, That's doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we want to encourage those ponies to move up um, and to you know perform at the highest level possible. What do you see breed-wise show up? Well, I'd say any given year we might have as many as 15 different breeds. Um We've had breeds, we've had Dakota ponies come, we've had Icelandic ponies come, which is quite interesting. Um, we've had every kind of cross you can imagine. We've had, of course, German riding ponies, we've had uh, Dutch ponies, we've had um, quarter ponies, we've had uh, Arab ponies, we've had, you know, anything you can possibly imagine that is um, 149 centimeters with shoes, 148 without. So, uh, um, we'll uh, come uh, to the show. Is that 14 and a half hands? By the way, I don't know. Yeah, it's, four, it's like 14, two and a quarter plus a little smooch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a smooch? That's, that's a for the shoe. Of that's for the shoe. Little, <laughs> yeah, that's for the shoe. A little smooch for the shoe. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit bigger than 14, two and a quarter, but only very slightly. So um, that makes you a pony. How long has this been going on, this cup? I um, started it in 2007. The first show actually was in 2008 at the uh, Paxton Farm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and the concept of the show was to um, have a place for ponies to compete against one another in competition rather than being in the classes with the horses. And uh, we designed it so that you would compete the top two tests of the level over two days. So you wouldn't have to have um, only be competing at um, in one test. So um, you have a little bit of a chance both days to redeem yourself or to, you know, make a huge error one way or the other. It's kind of a nail biter. <laughs> To see who's going to end up on top, I mean, it really comes down to, you know, tenths or hundredths of points sometimes um, between the champion uh, and the reserve. Um, and so that's really a, an exciting aspect. Um, we didn't require you to have, um, and we still don't require you to have qualifying scores to come to the Pony Cup. Oh, really? Um, okay. we, we, we want to encourage people to try dressage because it's such a wonderful sport. And um, that's why we included introductory level, uh, because we think that's important for people to be able to come and compete at that level as well, if it's their first show or if that's strictly the level at which they're competent, that um, is fine, too. Now, do, um, do you, um, so what level does it go up to then? It goes up to all, all levels, any okay. level. Got it. So okay. you, can be, you can compete at introductory level. You can compete at Grand Prix. You can uh, okay. compete at, at more than two levels at the show, um, as long as they're consecutive levels. Um, you can also have two different riders compete on the same pony because we actually have separate classes for the divisions. So, um, say the trainer could ride the pony at training level, or maybe yeah, training level, and you could do introductory level. Um, it's um, as long as they're in sequence. So um, you can't, so, we follow all the same rules as the USDF has. So do you see mostly larger ponies or do you see ponies of every size, small, medium, and large? Well, I, I would say every size. Um, there'll be smaller ponies there with uh, smaller riders. And 
you know, 13 hands. I don't know if we've had anything 12 hands. We've had relatively small ponies compete with people who were, you know, just shy of five feet tall uh, or children. Um, sometimes they're on the very small ponies. Um, and then we'll have very large ones as well. And we have um, within the Pony Cup um, show at the horse park, we have a way to include the ponies or the slightly oversized ponies. Um, so like the Welsh cobs or halflingers or um, uh, fjords or so some of the breeds. Is that the giant they, class? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it would be giant or horse class. Now, is that, are and, you uh, looking there at height or width? Because some of those halflingers <laughs> get pretty yes, wide. Well, yes, yes. Vertically challenged <laughs> and uh, horizontally challenged ponies. Uh, but so the way that this whole pony thing works is that if your breed is considered a pony breed, like Connemara's, um, halflingers are not technically a pony breed, but we include them. Um, and also uh, fjords and um, Welsh, um, where they can be slightly oversized, but not 16 hands right. um, a lot of times. Um, what we let them do is compete in the regular horse show that's going on around us, um, which is the Kentucky Dressage Association's show. Um, they compete the same two tests of the level um, on the same two days, and we average their scores together with all of the other Welsh ponies that are competing at the show, and they compete for the breed award. They don't compete for the cash, but they do compete for the bragging rights for their breed. Well, that's a very good idea. So that way it encourages the breeders to bring as many horses, as many animals as they can. That's a great idea, yeah. Yeah, and this year we added a pony futurity for four-, five-, and six-year-old ponies. Um, and we also have the first-of-its-kind pony breed show going on, one on Saturday and one on Sunday. And uh, Got it all going, is, girl. I know, and on top of that... We are live streaming on the USEF network. I saw that. Is this the first year you're doing that? Yes, this is the first year, and our commentator is Axel Shiner, which is very exciting. Now, explain to people who don't know Dressage who he is. Um, well, he is a, uh, a Olympic-level judge who also has judged the Pan Am Games and the World Equestrian Games and also... Um, pony championships in Europe, and he's very well regarded all over the country as a fine judge and commentator. Um, and so he is going to come and give us sort of color commentary while watching the various dressage tests um, and give us um, an idea of what we should be looking at, all of the different breeds that'll be there. Um, probably, I know, have Morgan ponies and Welsh ponies and Halflinger ponies and Connemara ponies. And so each of them has um, you know, special history behind them. And um, all of them move a little differently and have strengths and weaknesses that he might be able to help point out. And also, he has such a vast knowledge of dressage. I think he will be able to help people understand the sport a little bit better, too. Well, that, we're glad you're doing that. And for those of you that have not watched the USEF network yet, it's free. It's not a paid network. The FEI network is uh, a paid network, but USEF network is free. And you'll be able to catch us. It's July 8th, 9th, and 10th. It's at the Kentucky Horse Park or in the comfort of your own home. Just search for USEF network. I think it's USEFnetwork.com. Uh, well, well, good luck with this. I'm so excited. You know, I'm a pony guy, so I'm, I, I'll be tuning in off and on throughout the, your time there. Well, I'm glad you will. I hope everybody else will, too. I think I'm so excited. Every year I feel like this is just a big party for all of our pony friends and pony enthusiasts all over the country. And it's so nice to be able to um, host all of them and showcase all of their talent and all of their dedication to the sport. There we go. We'll tell folks where they can go website and Facebook-wise to learn more. Our website is dressageponycup.com, and our Facebook page is National Dressage Pony Cup. Awesome. Stop by. Thanks and, a lot, Jenny. We and, appreciate it. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com.
The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Feeding your horse starch-laden grains can lead to colic, laminitis, and metabolic disease. Today, nutritionists are recommending the use of high-quality fat to provide healthy calories. Fat is an extraordinary energy source. It's readily utilized by the horse and contains more than two times the calories of starchy grains. Replacing grain with a high-quality fat supplement reduces a horse's risk of developing health problems. Equijoule Stabilized Rice Bran is an excellent fat supplement. It contains a balanced calcium to phosphorus ratio and won't cause mineral imbalances when added to the diet. Its all-natural ingredients are high in healthy fat and fiber. And best of all, horses fueled by Equijoule stay calmer and more focused on the job at hand. When you need to add healthy calories to your horse's diet, choose Equijoule. To learn more, visit Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Wouldn't it be wonderful if your horse could enjoy a zone of repellency from pesky flies? Well, he can with EcoVet. EcoVet is an entirely new type of fly repellent that is safe for horses and those applying it, offering a real alternative to toxic pesticides like pyrethrins. EcoVet confuses an insect's normal directional ability, the bug's GPS, if you will. So if it can't locate your horse, it can't bite your horse. Dr. Wendy Ying from the Driving Radio Show has been using it in South Florida, also known as the Jurassic Park of biting insects, and she just loves it. EcoVet's active ingredients are naturally occurring food-grade fatty acids that have been clinically shown to improve the condition of horses with difficult-to-treat sweet itch problems. EcoVet is effective on mosquitoes, ticks, noceums, as well as flies. You can visit EcoVet online at eco-vet.com for more information or to order. You can find EcoVet at Dover Saddlery Stores and EcoVets on Facebook. Just search EcoVet, E-C-O-V-E-T. Well, this evening, we are so happy to have 1999 uh, Pan Am medalist and S judge Donna Richardson back to go through the pre-St. George. Donna, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. (laughs) We're glad we grabbed you for another level. So we'll start her right away. Phil, can you read the purpose of the uh, pre-St. George? All right. Um, I'm not sure. this. So these tests are not written by your national organization. That's I think we should talk about that first. I mean, it's it's an FEI test, which means um, this test was created by the Federation Equestrian International, and that um, you know it's it's the same test that everybody rides worldwide. So that that's a little bit of a different thing, you know, than all the previous tests that were written by your um, that we use in in Canada and uh, well America first, and we just sort of steal it so we have a <laughs> a normal basis of of competing in in North America. Um, so this, this one gives us an idea that, you know, pre-St. George's are written all over the world, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, it's, so, it's, uh, the Canadians steal our tests all the time. Actually, the Mexicans <laughs> steal our national tests as well. They're, they're generally quite well written and very popular, but the pre-St. George is the same whether you write it in Australia or Africa or Europe or the United States. It's the same test anywhere. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. Right. Once you get into the international level, you don't have to memorize. Well, for this, you don't have to be trying to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it sort of you know, um, in the international shows, uh, you know, su- supposedly, you know, like you you can write a test in America and sort of judge your results against somebody in Europe or Australia, New Zealand, whatever. Um, you know, yeah. because we use a lot, of, you know, the same judges basically, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so, certainly in the, interna- the international shows, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, I don't know, they don't call it a purpose, but this test represents the medium stage of training. It comprises exercises to show the horse's submission to all the demands of the execution of classical equitation and a standard of physical and mental balance and development, which enable him to carry them out with harmony, lightness and ease. So the purpose the purpose here is written a little differently than than sure. the ones that we've gone through and that we've 
we've um, it's it's sort of less less um, exacting as to what the purpose is. Um, yeah. I always get a little chuckle out of that. This test is of medium standard. For a lot of people in the United States, this would be writing a test and getting a 65 would be like winning gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah, it's but true. The FBI is looking at this as a continuum. For them, the advanced standard starts at intermediate two, and the very advanced standard is Grand Prix and Grand Prix Special. So, in the vast scheme of international dressage, this is medium. Uh, and the one thing I would please beg of everyone is. I know it's fun to buy the Shad Valley, but when you get the Shad Valley and you get the pre St. George horse, make sure that you as a rider are up to the standard that the horse is. I hate to say it, but a lot of times we see people coming in and sometimes you swear the only thing that's holding them on that horse who is trying his guts out is the curb rein and the spurs that are nailed into the horse's side. Uh, it's easy to buy three things or chores if you have the money. It's not so easy to ride them correctly. Yeah, very true. Very I'll true. get off my soapbox now. No, but I think that's <laughs> great. And it is, you know, and, and I think everybody, when you put a shad belly on, it really is an honor. I mean, and it is an honor, and you're going in front of very well-educated judges, and I think you're right. I think this is something that uh, has to be looked at. Like, this is this is hard, and this takes a lot of work. So, so Donna, let's start, let's start with the trot work. Well, you canter in. That's that's the first thing. And then uh, let's go with the trot work in the pre-St. George. Uh, <clears throat> uh, right. It's a medium trot across the diagonal. And what we're looking for in a medium trot is not legs flying everywhere, but that the horse's stride lengthens and he begins to show a little bit more cadence, a little bit more time off the ground with a clear transition back to an active collective trot at the end. Short side, the judge is looking to see whether you've got a collected trot. Does that horse look like he's in self-carriage? Then you come out of the corner into the shoulder in. Are there three tracks? Is the horse steady on the bit? Does it look like the rider is overbending the neck? Sometimes we see neck in and not shoulder in. For me, uh, as a rider, I can tell pretty much how much angle I have. I pretend there's a human being walking off my horse's outside shoulder. And if that human being can fit between the horse's outside shoulder and the rail, I've probably got enough angle for people who have a little trouble visualizing how much is enough, how much is not enough. And then it'd be your eight meter circle. Now we're going yeah, well, to eight just, meters. Sorry. I just want to jump in here for a second. Um, because mm-hmm. we, we see the shoulder and it occurs first of all, at second level, and now again, we're looking at it again, what what would tell you that um, the difference between a horse doing shoulder in at second level and the horse that you now see at Pre St. George, how should those two shoulder ins look differently? The purists will say, oh, there should be no difference. But let's face it, a second level horse is not going to show you the level of engagement and uphill balance that we're expecting to see in a Pre-St. George horse. That pre-St. George horse needs to come off the track with his shoulders and stay there. At second level, they're going to wobble a little bit, and you probably don't take it too seriously if they show bend and some balance. But at pre-St. George, that horse has got to go down that long long side and shoulder in like he's on railroad track. That's a really good visual, actually. That's That's a a great point. Yeah, yeah, in good balance, yeah. Super. Okay, and then, then we, we into the, continue to our little circle. And then into the half back. Make sure you start, you finish your circle. Many times people get anxious and they start that half pass, especially if the horse isn't really good at the left half pass. They're going to start it as soon as they can. Well, if you don't finish the circle, you start it with your haunches leading, which mm, five, six ish, you know, it's not going to score well, even if you manage to get those shoulders ahead. Take your time, finish the circle. And then uh, track left, that's an easy one. And now we're looking for a difference in the length of stride in this extended trot. Uh, again, not falling on the forehand. I like to think of it as a horse as a, 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 an airplane getting ready to take off in these extensions, that they go forward uphill and then they come back on a soft aid and not that the rider has to struggle the whole short side to get that horse back to collection. Then you just got the just no problem, right? It's up alongside your shoulder and circle hunches in. I mean, I have to pass the other one. 
straighten, walk, and now we have our walk pirouette. Um, these are pretty telling. Uh, a lot of times if the horse loses his rhythm in the walk, he starts to get a little lateral, it's because the collection in the walk was started before the horse was really through. And that's going to hurt your gait marks as well. Uh, on the short side, right in front of the judge, you want to start with a little shoulder floor before your first pirouette, and it must be smaller than the walk turn on the haunches that we've been doing through third level. Uh, forward, again, the judge is going to check the rhythm in the walk, shoulder four, a little bit before the second walk pirouette. And now is when the judge gives the, the movement, the Excuse me. The marks for the mm-hmm. uh, the walk, the collected walk, collected come walk. across the diagonal. Mm-hmm. Allow that horse to reach. The horse should want to reach out to the bit. If you see the rider putting the hands really wide and wiggling that bit and just coaxing the heck out of the horse to stretch, you know that that's a horse that's not really longitudinally supple. He's probably been held in a frame for a fairly long time, and he's lost his desire to stretch his back. For most horses, that extended walk on the diagonal should be a real relief. It's a little bit of a rest before they have to pick it up again and go through the canter work. Mm-hmm. So you before, finish your yeah. Sorry, before walk. we start the canter, I just wanted to go through uh, the pirouettes because we see a lot of, I think, common faults in the pirouette move here in the pre St. George. Maybe we can go through a couple that that you see a lot and that can be, you know, sort of corrected with some guidance. Uh, probably one of the common things you see is that the horse gets stuck. They lose the rhythm. Uh, instead of taking active, even steps with the hind leg, one leg will just stick itself into the ground and turn. Uh, that's, again, something that you can help a lot of times by schooling them a little bit bigger. Schooling your walk pirouettes as a 10-meter circle with the haunches in so that the horse gets the feeling that he can bend around your inside leg and keep moving. The walk pirouette is actually a little bit of a preparation for P.O. Uh, the horse really has to collect to it, stay active with his hind leg. Another common fault is the horse finds it difficult to stay in that little tiny uh, circle, so their haunches will swing out. And that's where the outside leg is not pushing the, the haunches in so much as guarding against them swinging out. And what about uh, the crossing crossing of the hind legs? I think I see that quite a bit, too. That just happens when people, are, again, are trying to make, make the circle a little bit too small. Um, and it, it's, it's a lot like the, the canter pirouettes. They're on the side of activity and slightly bigger rather than trying to make it too small and losing your rhythm, both in walk and canter. That makes sense. Very good. Very good. Yeah, so we can go right, yeah, right back to where we were. I guess I think we were... Proceeding in collected canter. Right. But before we do that, we have to go from extended walk to collected walk. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you should practice a lot at home because a lot of times the horses immediately sense that, uh-oh, she's picking the legs up, uh, the reins up. I had better do something. And that's mm-hmm. usually jog. And so that's what you'll see. The horse gets a little tense and, st- and the either jogs or they'll actually pick up the the canter a little bit before the rider asks. So don't be afraid at home to extend the walk, collect the walk, and then walk through the whole short side without doing anything else except walk so that the horse learns sometimes we just walk. We don't always immediately shorten the reins and off into the canter. But unfortunately, Good that point. is what happens in the same yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's true, though. And you have that short side to balance the horse, get them active, because the very first thing that happens out of that corner is you half pass left. And again, a stride of positioning, shoulder four, shoulder in, whatever you want to call it, make sure you get those shoulders leading. The horse should be supple enough that he can flow over there toward the center line, get there a little bit before X, and same thing as in a trot half pass. Before you get there, you're starting to change the bend ever so slightly, and when you ask for the flying change, the flying change occurs from the rear, and the very first stride of that flying change is shoulders leading to the right so that you don't start haunches leading 
So Donna, what is, there, oh, I'm sorry. No, what is, when you see haunches leading, that happens a lot to people. What do the judges take oh, yeah. off when, when you see the haunches leading? What's the sort of the takeoff for that? Uh, you're looking at a five. Okay. Uh, so and if, do it. If, if you correct it, um, maybe you could get a five, five, or if it's a really super half fast in the second half of six. But mm -hmm. uh, if you continue the whole way with the haunches leading, you're probably going to get a four. Okay. So know, know where your shoulders are in relation to the haunches. We always want to put the shoulders in front of the haunches, not the other way around. Right, right. Got it. Okay, sorry. Proceed. I apologize. Jumped in there. Okay, no problem. So we're, we're half-assing merrily on the right. And same issue is going to come up. We've got to get that horse a little bit shoulder forward to the left while he's still on the right lead. And then your flying change will come through straight. And again, you have the short side to kind of reorganize a little bit. And now comes the most collected movement in the entire cast. Come onto that diagonal. Do not wait until you're starting the turn before you drop that horse into a pirouette canter. We're looking to see the horse take the weight on the hind legs and then turn, not just to get into the turn and somehow say, oh, okay, I better balance back a little bit because this rider is really turning me around pretty fast. Show the collection first, and then your canter pirouette will be more likely balanced. You can make it smaller. The horse is more likely to stay on the bit. And this you practice at home. Go on to the diagonal. School canter. Don't necessarily do a pirouette and go forward. School canter again so that the horse can be adjustable. You want to have a school canter where you're not holding the horse with the reins as much as you are holding him with your torso. After you finish your absolutely marvelous small mm -hmm. pirouette we'd like to see the hind legs on the size of about a dinner plate but it doesn't happen very often you hold that stride it's maybe one or two just one or two steps just to say see i'm not in a hurry to get out of this and then you ride forward for your change if a horse is being held 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 in that pirouette they're going to have a heck of a time coming forward through the corner holding the counter canner and getting a flying change in front of the judge same thing occurs on the next half diagonal. Develop your school canter before you get your half pirouette. Hold it a stride or two. Come forward in balance through that corner. Move the shoulders over a little bit before you get to letter C. Line change. And now comes the tempi changes. And again, your horse should be really comfortable with this. Uh, because now you're going to be judged not only is it a clean change, but it, is it a straight change? Is it an uphill? Is it an expressive change? And does the balance stay good enough that you can get the next change within four strides? If the horse is unbalanced or pulling, you're going to have a hard time getting the count. Mm -hmm. Canter to the short side, and now you get to do it every three strides. And hold your breath. Hopefully, everything goes <laughs> well. Come out of the next corner and... They saved the extended canter for the end. I think for a good reason. A lot of horses really get strong in this. Let them be expressive as you can. Take a little risk here. Judges will reward the rider who really goes for it. And there are two marks here. So if you really go for it and you get an eight on your, or nine on your extended canter, and then maybe the horse doesn't come back so well, mm -hmm. um, but somehow manages to get the change on the straight line and it's clean, but also on the forehand, you'll probably get me, you can at least pull a six out of that, which is going to be better than somebody who just conservatively goes across the diagonal and gets a six on the extension and a six on the, um, uh, the flying change at the end. And that flying change, by the way, we want to see on the straight line. The essence of the movement is, can you collect that horse? on a straight line, balancing back enough so you can get the flying change. It's a little bit cheating if you let that corner collect him for you and you get your flying change in the corner. And judges are getting very strict about that now. That's how often do you see that? Lower out of, uh, how many times out of 10 do you see it in the corner? At least four. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say a little uh, yeah, more. Yeah, I thought four, yeah. So that's yeah, good. Four, <laughs> that's not good enough. I, I think it's probably somewhere around six. <laughs> uh, it, it depends on where you're judging and the level of the, the competition. Uh, you yeah. go to a really big class like a CDI, and if 
uh, CDI in Wellington or CDI out here in Burbank, you're probably going to see 25 horses, and probably all but four or five of them will do it on the straight line, collect, and go forward in the change. Yeah. And then you just put a big smile, and as Axel Steiner says, you come down the center line, all he wants to see is two legs and a smile. In other words, <laughs> your horse better be straight and better look like you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And you salute and you give your horse a big hug because you have just done a good job in an international test. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I love it. Well, Donna, that was a fantastic go through the pre-St. George. And as you see, uh, it's it's not easy. And, and now I, we hope that everybody gets to at least, uh, you know, work toward the pre-St. George. And if you're riding it, now you have some tips. So, Donna, how can our listeners find you online if they have any questions? Oh, I'm happy to answer questions anytime. You can reach me at Donna at Fox little red on red animal fox run farm.com fantastic thanks donna thank you reese well, guys, I'm so excited. We have a new sponsor for the show tonight, and we got to test the product. And I was so excited because this, you know, this is a high-end product, and they sent one out to us so we could really put it through the works. We've uh, tried it out several times, and I'll tell you what, we love this thing. It's Hindsight Vision. It's a camera, wireless camera system for your trailer or for your barn. And wow. we, we tried it out in the trailer, I'll tell you what, it really does work. The camera system was developed originally for those rowing teams. You know, they have the big long mm-hmm. skull boats, like the uh, like you see, uh, you know, Harvard rowing team and all of that. Yeah. Well, the guy who's doing all the calling, who has a name I can't remember, um, that sits in the front of the boat is facing the rowers, and and he's doing the calling. Well, he can't see where they're going. So they developed this camera to fit on the front of the boat, and then he puts the receiver unit, the TV camera part, or the TV part, between his feet, and, nice. which means it all has to be waterproof, right? Because it gets wet, really, really wet. And, and very that, hardy. Yeah. Very mm-hmm. durable, very hardy. It's in this, like, really thick plastic rubbery shell, and both the unit that goes in the truck with the screen and the, the unit that goes in the, the trailer is just uh, super tough. I dropped the trailer one when I was trying to hook, suck the cup <laughs> into the... I was trying to suck the cup into the ceiling, and I let go of it, and oh. I dropped it about six feet, and I'm telling you, any of those cheaper ones would have broke into pieces. This one, I said, oh, geez, I just got it first day. I haven't even tried it yet, and I dropped Dropped it, and it worked fine, no problem at all. Awesome. It's really made to, for for you know to take a beating. But the nice part about this is, and we've all done it. When you travel, you you don't know what your horses are up to. You stop at a traffic light, and all of a sudden there's kicking, and your whole yeah, whole truck's yes. moving, and the you're convinced moving. they've fallen down, and their legs are straight up in the air, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Bo, by the way, that's happened to us once when we got there. The <laughs> horse legs were, were straight up oh, in the air. Oh my god! Karen, who hosts our uh, endurance episode, travels all the time with her horses obviously she endurance rides every weekend and she had two arabs in the trailer she got to a four hour uh, trip she got there the one horse had fell down was oh. laying underneath the center partition under the other horse the fortunately the other horse apparently just did not move didn't step on oh. didn't step on his friend at all and uh, so she had a heck of a time just getting them separated. But had she had the camera, she figures that probably this happened. She heard a lurch or felt a lurch in the truck about halfway through this four-hour trip. Uh, so if she had the camera, she would have seen this had happened. She could have stopped much quicker and done something about it. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so, you know, safety-wise, I'm thinking that we all should have these now. They're affordable. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, now that they're wire-free, the battery on the camera and the, the receiver unit lasts four hours. So you can plug it into the truck. You can plug it into any of the, mm-hmm. the plugs in the truck. You can even wire the camera and leave it permanently in the trailer. So you can wire it into the trailer wiring and just leave it in there permanently. Uh, and you can hook up to four cameras to the receiver unit and it rotates through them. Awesome. So that's kind of cool. The other thing is if you're using it to watch babies or Reese, in your case, to watch the horses in the barn, mm-hmm. if you yeah. need to, um, it'll go up to 1,760 feet. If, the, if you awesome. have clear vision, if there's not a building in the way, it'll go up to 1,760 feet. Um, that's crazy. So it is really cool. It was How many easy- meters is that? Uh, well, that's, that's, <laughs> I have no idea, <laughs> that is, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> it, it's a long way. It's a long way. I can Google it. 
I I love this thing. I have looked. We have looked at the others, the the uh, more inexpensive versions, and I we just you would not want to leave them in your trailer here in Florida with all the humidity. And I think this one you're not going to have a problem because of the casing it's in. It's made to. It's made for that. Uh, so if you want a super tough, it's 2.4 gigahertz wireless camera and monitor system, which is really good. And as I said, it wasn't made for horses initially, so this was made to be underwater. It's made to be tough, and you know it just converted over well to the horse world. Check nice. it out at hindsightvision.com. That's H-Y-N-D sightvision.com. H-Y-N-D sightvision.com. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. Well, Phil, we have a listener question for our Total Saddle Fit Tip of the Week. What you got? This is a great question, and I do a lot of teaching on this particular problem. Um, So our listener posted to the Dressage Radio Show Facebook page, does anyone have exercises to create more jump in the horse's canter? I have a seven-year-old thoroughbred that does quite well in dressage, but always gets comments about the canter needing more jump. So I'm going to throw it to you first here, Reese, and we'll... Sure. Yeah, no, I think this is a common problem. And and, and we deal, both Phil and I deal with a lot of thoroughbreds, uh, which is, you know, an interesting... Uh, an interesting combination. My thoroughbreds that I mostly deal with are upper level of enters. <laughs> so, uh, yes, jump is an issue, especially going toward for the more upper level guys for collection, uh, for sure. Um, but you know, one of the things that I really am a fan of, and, and I think I know Phil is too, is a lot of transitions, Transi- transitions within the gate, um, forward and back, especially in the canner. And, and when you come back, kind of recycling the energy that you got in the, in the forward part. So that the horse, you know, again, you want to bring them back and you want them, you're asking the hind legs to get quicker and to jump more. So, um, we do a lot of forward and back, uh, canter walk transitions, getting the horse again to step back on the hind legs, carry the weight and jump into the canter. Um, and I also like trot canter transitions, trot canter, trot canter, trot canter. I think those are really, really important, uh, transitions that you can do. So Phil, how about, what are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, basically on, along the same lines, I think the, the thoroughbreds in general have a little bit of a harder time just in general with co- the idea of collection, whether it's in the trot and the canter. Um, I think you're, you're good on a thoroughbred because they have a very, good canter rhythm Mm -hmm. so you're already sort of one step ahead of maybe some other breeds that maybe don't um i know for sure one of those breeds is i ride uh, a few frisians and have trained a few frisians in my time yes and their (laughs) rhythms are not that they have more of a collected canter but the rhythm is not as good so um you know praise your praise your thoroughbred for their great rhythm but they just (laughs) don't have a hard time shortening their stride so um uh, for me, my favorite thing is just you know getting on a twenty meter or even a fifteen meter circle, and and developing the collection through canter walk, a lot of canter walk, canter walk, canter walk, and paying attention to um, when they go from walk to canter that you restrict the size of the stride. You know that's you know there's a couple of strides between the the walk and the canter that you have the best ability to make the most difference. Um, so really pay attention to that because it's not. It's not going to work if you if you ask the horse to canter and the and the horse just he sort of runs forward you know into the canter and just picks the size of the stride or or picks picks the gait that he wants to do that's the easiest for him. So you've got to to change things. You've got to challenge the horse a little bit to to do it a little bit differently. Um, the other thing I would I would say and um, you know a little bit of cross training is to do some some canter poles or some trot poles to create the collection. You know. Uh, set it where the horse is comfortable in a good stride, and then just start to shorten it. And 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 again, the horse is going to feel a little uncomfortable when you start to mess with their gates a little bit because, you know, they've gone for as long as they have. Even if it's just three years, you're starting your horse from scratch. They have the they have the size of the gate they're comfortable with. You know, um, whenever you a rider tries to change that, they're not going to be super comfortable with that. You can feel them struggle sometimes. You can feel it get you know feel very weird for a few strides. I mean, those are all good indicators that you're on the right track. Um, 
and then just yeah just daily chipping away at the problem you know and and uh and making a, a little difference over a lot of days you can yeah. really uh help your horse learn to collect yeah because this isn't you know it's you can't do it in one day that's not fair. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot to change in one day. And I think that's where people get wrong. They're like, okay, I'm going to do this today. Well, probably not because it also takes strength because they don't canter that way and you're changing it. So I think that's something you also have to remember is that does take some time. Uh, but I love the canter pull idea. I think that's a really, really helpful idea. Yeah, I mean, just uh, that also helps them just pick up their legs a little bit, you know, and mm-hmm. you can go ahead and try and really shorten them. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is that the horse is going to yeah, knock they- the pole. Yeah, or they break bang or, his foot or whatever, you know. That they don't, you know, it's usually not a big deal. Yeah, they do it once and they'll pick their feet up. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can always let us know how that goes or try the yeah. exercises or, um, we love it. yeah, we'll get a little feedback on our, on our, um, on our tips. That would be great. This tip brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, the shoulder relief girth that Reese and Philip both love. And here's why. The saddle fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the shoulder relief girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. At totalsaddlefit.com. Visit totalsaddlefit.com. Well, as you know, we love listener and Facebook shout outs, so keep them coming. And you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on a great show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you next week. 